Thank you for watching this video from the Center for European Studies at Carleton University. This project has received funding from the European Union and Carleton University. The views expressed in this video do not reflect those of the European Union or the Center for European Studies. Hi, I'm Merrick Eby with the Center for European Studies at Carleton University, and I'm joined today by Dr. Sebastian Baglioni. He's a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Political Science at Carleton University, and his research areas are Spanish and European Union politics. So thank you for joining me today, Dr. Baglioni. My pleasure. We've seen in the past year several uh, independence referendums or votes in uh, member states of the European Union with varying degrees of legitimacy. So I was wondering, um, what are the social, political, and economic factors that are underlying this sort of recent trend or recent spate of votes for independence? Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, these are, well, they are complex processes and um, uh, you will find different variations of, of contextual factors at play, right? Just uh, comparing the Scottish referendum to the, to the, to the Catalan referendum, uh, the, the factors at play are very different. Uh, but I would say um, there are probably three main factors at play here. Uh, the first one is the the drivers, right? You need some kind of uh, activation of these kind of claims, and that usually falls in the hands of nationalistic parties. And um, they might do it because they believe in independence as a genuine goal, or more um, instrumental or electoral calculus, uh, because they know that playing the nationalistic card, uh, they might um, they might get better results in the next election. So that would be the weakest argument in favor of this independence. Right? I'm not saying the old independent movements are uh, uh, relying on that kind of uh, calculus, but certainly it's part of the game. Uh, more importantly, uh, there is economic factors. And uh, this has to do with usually the um, relative distribution of uh, the, the national budget, which is usually at the national center, not in the hands of the region in particular. So that's um, typically uh, a source of grievance for the region in question, um, because either they're not happy with uh, the way the national government is implementing the budget or the kind of economic decisions they're making, or they because you know they want to do it themselves. Right? And certainly the, str the strongest argument is framed usually in normative terms. And this uh, means that these regions redefine themselves not as regions, but as nations. And by doing so, uh, they claim the associated rights of national self-determination and sovereignty. Uh, this is a strong normative claim that uh, some of these regions make. Um, and it's a necessary step towards independence, right? Because the, the rationale here is, if we're not a region, we are a nation, and therefore we should enjoy uh, sovereignty, we should enjoy uh, some form of statehood as any other state around the world uh, is, uh, is entitled to. Uh, so as I said before, uh, depending on the context and the particular uh, situation in each of these countries, uh, like in these examples, the UK, Spain, or Italy, um, the relative weight of each of these factors and the combination or emphasis from one to the other might vary. But I would say uh, they are all present in, in these contexts. In the Scottish referendum, uh, the European level or the European Union context was very present in debates over independence um, on both sides. Both sides, sides used sort of the European argument uh, in making their case for or against independence. So in broad terms, I mean, how has the context of European Union integration affected regional nationalist movements and regional independence movements? Uh, yes, uh, this, well, it's, it's a long story, but um, in, in the 90s, with the creation of the Committee of the Regions, that was a buzzword, right, the Europe of the Regions back then, uh, some of these uh, regions and some of these parties were uh, quite excited about this, right? They saw that as a strong opportunity to have a, a strong voice in EU affairs. That proved um, not so successful insofar as the Committee of the Regions uh, was a merely advisory body, so they didn't have a vote and they didn't force, they didn't have the capacity to force any decision 
in EU affairs. So, um, then nonetheless, many of these parties uh, started participating in the Committee of the Regions, but then um, sooner or later it was uh, downplayed just because it was not effective as a um, as an institution where they could um, gain representation or voice in uh, EU affairs. A better strategy that some of these parties have followed is um, what is called paradiplomacy. Uh, paradiplomacy is a strategy whereby some of these regions of these parties and sometimes governments in those regions attempt to articulate their own agenda and uh, represent their own interests uh, at the European level by passing the, uh, the central or national government. I, um, like the Basque Country or Catalonia might set up office in Brussels to represent their interests and try to lobby for certain policies independently of uh, the Spanish government position. Uh, this is a mix of uh, success and failure, but it's, uh, it's quite an interesting phenomenon that these, some of these regions have followed as a way to express themselves at uh, the European Union level. Canada has a long history of um, dealing with independence movements or nationalist movements within its own provinces. Um, given this fact, are there any lessons from the Canadian experience uh, that could be useful to European Union member states dealing with their own regional nationalisms. What can member states learn from the Canadian experience uh, when dealing with these uh, regional independent movements? Uh, I would say is the value of asymmetry. Right? The, the, the attempt at accommodating certain claims and certain um, um, demands coming from uh, one province in particular or one region into um, these asymmetric federal arrangements, whereby that particular region or province will enjoy certain powers that other regions or other provinces don't. Right? Spain has a long and painful story with this. Right? Catalonia, the Basque Country, and Galicia were recognized as special regions, separate or distinct from the rest of the regions in Spain. That, by and large, has proved to be not enough for nationalist uh, parties in all these three regions, with different degrees and depending on the moment we're talking about, uh, especially in the Basque Country. Uh, but certainly a degree of uh, asymmetry, uh, I would say, is necessary in order to accommodate that. So that, that I think that the Canadian experience has proved, um, uh, has shown uh, this, 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 the, the potential for these kind of solutions. It's not easy, there will be drawbacks and, and, and problems and tensions uh, will persist, but um, th this is not the kind of uh, political problem that has a magical solution. And one day, you know, one day we'll reach at that solution and that's the end of the thing, right? That's the end of the story. Uh, rather, it's an ongoing process where uh, you will have uh, rounds and rounds of negotiations, right? as, as the Canadian experience itself shows that too. Managing the European Union, managing um, these kind of tensions coming from regional independence movements uh, is, uh, is I, I want to say limited, but it's still, um, it, it still shows potential. Right? The European Union has embraced, um, on the one hand, uh, asymmetry, some kind of asymmetry, um, sometimes across member states and sometimes uh, regarding regions in particular, right, uh, where they allow uh, for national variation or regional variation in, in terms of cohesion funds or structural funds. Um, but also, quite interestingly, um, starting with Lisbon in 2007-2009, uh, the slow implementation of the, of the last treaty of the European Union, uh, the EU has embraced uh, the principle of subsidiarity, whereby um, uh, political action and decisions should be taken at, at the appropriate level. Right? So that means that some decisions will be taken at the European level, some decisions will be taken at the national member states level, but some at the sub-national, right, regional level. The way that will be implemented and, and the actual record uh, of um, practice in that is still open. Uh, it's, it's, very real, it's, it's, very, uh, it's very new development. We only had five, six years. Uh, so it remains, it remains to be seen how effective this would be, right? but certainly it opens up possibility for some of these regions.